So a conference speaker had been asked to talk about uh, uh, on the topic of relevant preaching, and he decided to share what he had learned about helping people deal with death. And he gave uh, this talk, and afterwards a, a young student came up to him and said, you know, I don't get why you wanted to talk about death today. It just doesn't seem that relevant. It kind of re reminds me a little bit of the, the guy who saw a commercial on, on uh, burial plots and he thought to himself, you know, that's the last thing I need. <laughs> when, when Steve Jobs uh, was asked to, to deliver the commencement address at Stanford University back in 2005, uh, he chose to talk on three topics and you could read his, uh, his commencement address in your version. Uh, notes uh, later on today. He chose to talk about three topics, and uh, one of those three topics, the final of the three topics, and really the most memorable of those three topics, was the subject of death. This is a commencement address. He had been diagnosed with cancer the year before, and living with that diagnosis had given him a new perspective, a new clarity, a new focus that he felt he really uh, had been called to share with others. He couldn't think of a more relevant topic to talk about to a group of new graduates. Death represents one of the greatest emotional and spiritual challenges in life. And it challenges us on at least two fronts facing the fact of our own mortality, and also dealing with the death of those whom we love. And this is why the Bible contains literally hundreds and hundreds of references to death. As a matter of fact, some of the verses and passages that people are most familiar with, if you think about them, actually have to do with death. Psalm 23 John 3.16, both of them deal with the topic of death. And while the Bible views death as a formidable foe, it also offers us clear and compelling reasons to live with hope in the face of death. And it does that in a way that no other book ever has, ever will. You know, I've, I've always been struck um, by uh, the, the Bible's honesty and realism. You know, a lot of people dismiss Scripture and they, they say, oh, you know, it's just wishful thinking and so on. I, I can't think of a book that is more realistic and, and more honest about life than the Bible is. It teaches, for instance, that, that death is universal and it is inescapable. You know, not all world religions teach that. But the Bible says that death is universal and inescapable. Hebrews 9.27 says in part that people, all people, are destined to die. And it goes on to say, and after that, the judgment. And that's true. We all are destined to die. You know, in the past year, we have had to say goodbye to some absolutely extraordinary people. I mean, think about it. Tom Petty, Greg Allman, Chuck Berry, Chris Cornell, Walter Beck, Glenn Campbell, Fats Domino, those are just the musicians. John Hurt, Roger Moore, Jerry Lewis, Martin Landau, Bill Paxton, Don Rickles, Mary Tyler Moore, Colin Dexter, and the list could go on and on and on, just a host of absolutely amazing people. And you know what they all have in common with one another and with us? We all die. Closer to home, here in our own Stonebridge Community Church family, we have had to say goodbye to some absolutely extraordinary, uh, extraordinary members of this church family this past year. And it is never easy to say goodbye. Uh, in the, um, the movie Stranger Than Fiction, has any, anybody seen that movie? It stars Will Ferrell. It's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. In this movie, Stranger Than Fiction, Will Ferrell plays an IRS agent named uh, Harold Crick. 
And he starts, he, it's about how he, this guy starts hearing this voice in his head. And it's not like, it's not that he's crazy that it's a voice telling him to do stuff. It is a voice that's actually narrating his life. And he finally puts it together that he is the character in a famous author's latest novel. One day he happens to change the time on his watch, uh, which there's another thing we all have in common, right? By the way, you guys look great with that extra hour of sleep today. <laughs> but one day, this guy happens to change the time on his watch, and the voice inside of his head says, little did he know this seemingly simple act would result in his imminent death. He panics, and, and he spends the rest of the movie trying to figure out how to change the end of the story. One of his friends offers him some counsel. He says, Harold, you will die someday, sometime. Heart failure at the bank, choke on a mint, some long, drawn-out disease you contracted while you were on vacation. You will die, he says. You will absolutely die. Even if you avoid this death, another death will find you. That's true. That fact that the death is, uh, is universal led an, un, un, an undertaker, mortician, with a, an especially wicked sense of humor to sign letters that he wrote to his buddies, eventually yours. <laughs> As... Um, as King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7, verse 2, death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Now, that doesn't mean that death by, by any means should become a morbid preoccupation. Uh, we, we can be aware, we can be aware of the inevitability of death without becoming fixated on it. And when we do, when we are aware of it without uh, having, being morbidly preoccupied with it, death can teach us some things that nothing else can. Death can teach us to, to put th the things that happen to us into perspective. Death can teach us to make the most of our time. Death can uh, encourage us to, to do what matters and spend more time with the people we love. I think this is why the, the psalmist prays, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. And he prays that not out of morbid preoccupation with death, but because death can be a really good teacher. Now, while we can acknowledge in principle, in principle, that death is both universal and inescapable, and that it has a lot to teach us, that does not mean that we are particularly comfortable with it. The truth is, death is deeply disruptive and disturbing. And we all know that. Psalm 55 offers an example of a person who is uh, completely traumatized by the fear of death. Obviously, there's something going on in this person's life such that, um, that, that they're filled with fear. My heart is in anguish within me, they write. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And you read that and, and uh, it, it does raise the question, why is it that death is so deeply disruptive and, and disturbing for us. Well, one, one reason is because we are absolutely helpless against it. I mean, you might win the battle, you will not win the war. It is, as we have, have just seen, it's universal and it is inescapable. I think another reason that death is, is so deeply disruptive and disturbing is uh, is the way it separates us from those we love. 
it is profoundly painful and disorienting to, to lose a loved one. Even if we and they are believers, we grieve. Now, we do not grieve as others who have no hope, but we grieve because of the separation. Following the initial shock, we, we feel sadness, we feel loneliness, and sometimes even uh, a period of hopelessness. Losing a loved one affects us emotionally. It affects us physically. It impacts us spiritually. Even uh, the, the most committed believer. C.S. Lewis writes in, uh, in the book, A Grief Observed. I talked about that book last week. He, he wrote that book uh, following the death of his beloved wife, Joy. He writes, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. It's like there's an invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says or, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting, he writes, yet I want others to be around me. I dread the moments when, when the house is empty. If only they talk to one another and not to me. This is C.S. Lewis. A third reason I think that the death is so deeply disturbing and disruptive has to do with our uncertainty about what happens next. I mean, death has been called the great unknown. And really, apart from Scripture, apart from Scripture, we know as little about what happens after death as we knew about what happens after birth before we were born. But we're still in the womb. What can we know about life? Even if it had been possible for someone to communicate with us, which it's not, but even if it were possible for someone to communicate with us about what life in this world is like, would we have the words? Would, would we have the life experience? Would we have the ability to understand even the simplest explanation or the most basic description? No, we, we wouldn't get it. And you know what? Apart from the Bible, we are left with little more than our own imaginations to piece together some kind of picture of what, and for some people, what, if anything, comes after death. I think that, that's why we're so intrigued with you know, these books about life after uh, death experiences. But ultimately, I think the greatest reason that death is so deeply disturbing and disruptive is because death is an intrusion. It feels like an intrusion to us personally because it is an intrusion into God's good creation. Unlike the heavens and the earth, unlike the sun, the moon, and the stars, unlike the plants of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all the other creatures that God brought into being, unlike people who were created male and female in the image and likeness of God, death held no place, and it did not belong in God's original perfect creation. Of course it feels like a disruption to us because we're created in the image and likeness of God. Death was an intrusion, a disruption, an encroachment into creation. 
And this is why John tells us in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, amazing, powerful, hope-filled passage that death will have no place in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that God has promised to bring about when Jesus Christ returns and the Lord makes all things new. The Lord himself will dry every eye. There will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death because the old things have passed away. But while the Bible is profoundly realistic, acknowledging that death is universal and inescapable, acknowledging realistically and honestly that death is deeply disruptive and disturbing, the good news of the gospel that we celebrate not just every Easter, but every Lord's Day when we gather together, there is a reason we, work, we worship on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, it's because we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that death has been defeated through Jesus' death and resurrection. Amen. Jesus Christ has changed the meaning of death. You know, when, when Paul writes that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes, that includes death. When the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul tells us that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord, nothing, that includes death. Jesus has changed the meaning of death. For Christians, for those who are in Christ, death now, rather than separating us from God and separating us from others, death through Jesus Christ is now a door. It is a gateway to God. For followers of Jesus Christ, death simply marks a transition. A transition from life with God in this world to life with God in the world to come. For disciples of Jesus Christ, death is not the end. Death is the beginning. The beginning of an adventure with God and with those whom we love who have died in Christ that goes on forever and ever and ever. Bishop Brent used a beautiful image to illustrate how Jesus' death and resurrection changed the meaning of death for those who trust themselves to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the unity of the Holy Spirit. Beautifully in, um, illustrates how death is a transition from life with God in this world to life with God in the world to come. A ship sails, he says, and, and I stand watching till she fades on the horizon. And someone at my side says, She's gone. Gone. Where? Gone from my sight. That's all. She is just as large as when I saw her. The diminished size, the total loss of sight is in me, not in her. And just at that moment when someone at my side says, she is gone, there are others who are watching her coming. And other voices take up the glad shout, there she comes. That is death. C.S. Lewis captures uh, that concept of an end ending that is in fact a beginning in the final chapter of the final book of his seven book series, The Chronicles of Narnia. It's a book called The Last Battle. And it's a book that's, that I treasure uh, in no small part because on the 20th anniversary of my becoming pastor here at Stonebridge, 
you all gave me a first edition of that book. But following, following this one great final battle that restores all of Nar Narnia to its original intended goodness and truth and beauty, Lewis tells his readers, the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I can't write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in, in this world, all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. What a beautiful and perfect picture. That's what death is. That's what death is for those who die in Christ. In John 11, chapter 20, or verse 25 and 26, Jesus is having a conversation with uh, one of his dear friends, a woman by the name of Martha. Uh, she's one of three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Lazarus, Martha had, had just told Jesus, um, was either about to die or had already. And Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her a question. Do you believe this? And I think that's a great question. Do you believe that? People have always wondered what happens when we or a loved one dies. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends at the church in Thessalonica, hey, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And you should read the passage because Paul, uh, it, this passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, tells so much about you know, what we need to know as we trust ourselves and those whom we love to God. The important thing is this. This is important for all of us who are here today. That you have a choice. You have a choice. And the choice is this, to face death alone or to face it with Jesus Christ. To view death as the end to understand that it is the start of a new way of being with God and with those we love. As we trust ourselves and our loved ones to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the unity of the Holy Spirit. We can live with hope in the face of death if we are in Christ. In our culture, um, there are, there's kind of a, a, a conventional wisdom in our culture uh, that says, 
if anybody dies, they go to heaven. I mean, it just comes with death. And that's not in Scripture. Conventional wisdom says that uh, if we're good people, when we die, we'll be with God. And that's not in Scripture either. The Bible teaches us that we're saved by grace through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is a gift of God. God's offering each and every one of us here today a gift that lasts forever and ever and ever. Forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life won by Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Do you believe this?